Good morning and welcome. Uh, I'm Trevor Morris and I'm the Dean of the Law School here at NYU. Uh, and I'm really thrilled to be able to welcome all of you to the Civil Jury Project's inaugural fall conference, The State and Future of Civil Jury Trials. So uh, we know, I think by being invited here, by coming here today, by recognizing the importance of this set of issues, uh, that there is a distinct phenomenon happening in this country that has been happening for the last several decades, and that is that civil jury trials are, a, I think it's fair to say, vanishing, or at least dramatically decreasing phenomenon in our legal system. Uh, some background facts, and thanks to Professor Sakharov for his help in assembling these. Uh, you can see this here. This displays the percentage of civil terminations during or after trial in U.S. district courts from the early 1960s through 2012 in that 50-year period. So as a percentage of overall dispositions, those disposed during trial, so those that got to trial and then were disposed during trial or that got through trial and were disposed through the culmination of a trial, uh, that percentage has dramatically decreased over time. We can see this phenomenon elsewhere, too. This chart shows the same basic directional slope, uh, looking at not just a federal court, but state trial courts in 15 states as well. Um, this is true as a, as a matter of trial disposition, actually. The, the trend is visible whether it would be bench or jury trial. So the jury trial, uh, uh, a decreasingly prevalent phenomenon, um, the trial, a decreasingly prevalent phenomenon. Um, it's not just a percentage matter, it's a volume matter as well. The sheer number of civil trials by bench or jury in federal district courts over that same 50-year period um, has overall decreased um, from a peak in the early 1980s uh, to a dramatic decrease down to today. Uh, this is notable. It's notable in light of a number of things. One is that, of course, the Seventh Amendment to our United States Constitution and the provisions of most state constitutions uh, do guarantee, in some form, the right to trial by jury in common law civil cases. Uh, the question is, what does it mean to have and to exercise that right uh, in light of this uh, phenomenon of a dramatically decreasingly prevalent uh, institution of the jury trial? Well, it is the goal of the Civil Jury Project to take up questions like these, to examine and initiate a dialogue about the decline in the number of civil jury trials and the implications of that decline on our legal system. Uh, it seeks also to create educational programs, uh, outlets for a broader public engagement with this set of issues, and to generate studies and policy proposals relating to the jury trial, both to understand how and why we are where we are today, and to come to grips with a serious ideas for reform to the extent they ought to be contemplated. In other words, to reevaluate the ways in which juries are constituted and operate and the ways in which jury trials are conducted. To quote from the Civil Jury Project's new website, which I encourage you to visit, the question is not simply whether there should be a right to trial by jury, but how that right can be exercised consistent with basic commitments to speedy and efficient resolution of civil disputes. Um, we believe this to be the only academic center in the country whose governing purpose is to examine uh, the right to the jury trial, what it means, in light of changing phenomenon about the prevalence of the jury trial across the country. Um, we naturally think that NYU Law School is the perfect place uh, for an institution such as this. And certainly its leadership is the perfect leadership for an institution such as this. Um, that's not me, that's this center. Um, uh, faculty director, directors, uh, Sam Asakharov and Kathy Sharkey are uh, spectacularly prolific and influential scholars on a range of topics, including civil justice. We also have here at the law school the Center for Civil Justice, which is, of which this project is an excellent complement. And in many ways, most spectacularly, we have Steve Sussman as the executive director of this project. 
Steve, I'm sure, is known to all of you in the room, and we could fill the rest of the day uh, with an appropriately um, <laughs> admiring introduction of him. Um, he has uh, really brought his vision and his commitment to this project after, or still in the midst of, a storied career as one of this country's truly one of a handful of the uh, most outstanding trial litigators in the country, a deep thinker about uh, the jury trial, as well as an outstanding practitioner of it, the founding partner of Sussman Godfrey. Um, he's been recognized for his outstanding uh, work as a litigator by virtually every entity that recognizes such things, including the Business Insider Law Review from 2010, which named his as one, him as one of the 11 lawyers you definitely do not want to see at opposing counsel's table. <laughs> um, I suspect that some of the other 10 may be here in the room, and we could take some direct testimony to that effect. Uh, I've never seen Steve in that context, and I pray never to. Um, I am very, very grateful to see him in this context as the executive director of the Civil Jury Project. I'm grateful to him that we have started this partnership, and I'm really excited about what the project will do uh, this year and over the coming years. So without further ado, I'll turn things over to Steve to say a few words, and then we'll get started with our first panel. Steve Sussman. Uh, several hundred years ago, uh, our Constitution was ratified, and next week is, as you know, Constitution Week. Uh, 14 years ago, uh, we suffered an attack on, the, to the day, we suffered an attack on the values which our Constitution stands for. Uh, and we lost a lot of good people. And so it's fitting that on this 9-11, we celebrate both the birth of our constitutional rights and uh, the anniversary of 9-11 uh, with talking about the only right that is mentioned four times uh, in the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, five times, I guess, in the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and three amendments of the Bill of Rights, the right to a, a jury trial. And I hope, thank you for coming, I hope someday you will be able to say that you were there when it began, this beginning of examination of what's happening to this right. Uh, is it really important that we retain it? And if so, what should we do uh, to keep it and to make sure it is vital and lives on? Uh, I, just a few announcements about the program today. There is no break shown on the program, uh, but, we'll, but uh, we, we will take one. Uh, and that break will be at 10.50 for just 10 minutes because we have a very tight program. We need to be done with this part of the program by 12.30. Uh, so we ask that, uh, you know, try to take the break at 10.50 if you can make it. If not, uh, and if you have to leave earlier to take a break, fine. But if you leave, please don't try to save seats for a long period of time because this hall holds about, I think, 200 people uh, or 300 people, and we have 420 registered for the program today, and there will be overflow uh, in the auditorium, but we're going to try to let people come in as seats open up. So please don't hold seats. Uh, we have with us today uh, around 50 of our academic, judicial, and jury consultant advisors. And they're all of those currently, the list are, these groups are in process of formation and they are all listed on our website. But if you see someone today with a plastic name tag, that represents either a, fe a judge, federal or state, an academic who is assisting with the jury project, or a jury consultant. And this effort, to my knowledge, is the first time the, the trial, the, the bar has aligned with jury consultants uh, in an effort to study uh, the jury system and what is happening to it. Uh, I also, so uh, introduce yourself at the breaks at lunch to our advisors. Uh, I want to recognize today, we also have a list of allied organizations. What we have discovered when we began this project is it's bipartisan. Uh, and it's important that we retain its bipartisanship. 
It represents both, both sides of the docket and both ends and sides of the political spectrum. And so we have uh, assembled a list of allied organizations that are going to help us and advise us and consult with us as we move ahead to study uh, the civil jury trial. Uh, those organizations who are here today have representatives, the, and I'd like to introduce them briefly. The American Association of Justice is represented by Tobias Melrode. The American Bar Association is represented today by Judge Barbara Lynn of the Northern District of Texas and Professor Sherry Diamond. The American Board of Trial Advocates is represented by its president, Joel Collins. The American Constitution Society is represented by David Brodsky, its president. The Center for Civil, on Civil Justice at NYU Law School, School of Law is represented by Peter Zemroff, the director. Uh, the New York uh, Law, NYU Law School Federalist Society is represented by Jack Millman, the executive vice president. International Academy of Trial Lawyers by Stuart Grossman and the Pound Civil Justice Institute by uh, Mary Kalishaw. Uh, and the Institute for Advancement of Legal Systems by its executive director, Rebecca Corliss. So, and we are still adding to this organization uh, or various legal groups uh, that in, I should, I don't think I have on here, but clearly we have with us today uh, the president Mr. Jensen of the American Society of Trial Consultants, and they are a very important part of this project. Uh, to assure that you get CLE credit, you must have signed in at the start uh, at the registration desk, and if you want it in New York, you've got to sign out at the end, uh, and it so has something to do with leaving your name tag at the desk. This conference is being videoed and live streamed online as we speak. Uh, at www.law.nyu.edu slash live stream. So if you have anyone in your office that you want or in your chambers that you want to watch while it's going on, you can give them that uh, internet address. Uh, because the program is being uh, live streamed, uh, we ask when questions, there will be questions, I think mics, I thought there were gonna be mics in the aisle, but maybe they're gonna be handheld. But we'll figure it out at the break, but that you will have an opportunity to ask questions. And we ask that you come to a central place where we make sure it's captured on videotape. Uh, we will break at 1230. Everyone has on their name tag a number. That number represents a table in the lobby on which your box lunch will be. So please, I mean, if you're number one, take a number one box because it represents what you selected. Everyone selected their own lunch. And I, I think we have number two and three also uh, out there on tables. Uh, please get your lunch and either finish by one o'clock or bring it back. You don't have to finish. Bring it back to your bring it back to your seat and finish. So at one o'clock promptly, Senator Whitehouse will begin. We will begin with Senator Whitehouse's a keynote address. We are very lucky to have him live today. There was a moment this week when we thought. Uh, the uh, vote on the uh, Iran deal was going to interfere with his appearance live. They solved that yesterday. Uh, unfortunately, they did not solve yesterday uh, all the weather problems that caused the New York airports to close. So one of our speakers, Judge Bennett from Iowa, made it as far as Dallas and could not get in. And he could not get, but he had to go to Chicago and couldn't get out of Chicago last night. They tell me he can't get out till this afternoon. So. We said, just stay in put, and we are bringing him to you at noon, as part of the panel at noon, uh, through uh, Skype. Uh, so uh, now uh, it's my uh, great pleasure uh, to introduce the moderator of our first panel, who is the reason, in fact, that Ellen and I decided to establish the Civil Jury Project at NYU. Whenever a trial lawyer in this country has a problem, a complex legal problem in a civil case that requires someone who's an expert on civil procedure and someone who has real credibility with every court in the country, they turn to Professor Sam Zakharoff. 
So when Ellen and I thought uh, about what law school would be the best host for this project, uh, we knew it was here because Sam was on the faculty and was willing to, in, in fact, take charge of it as our faculty, one of our faculty advisors. Uh, the lineup of uh, today's speakers and the record crowd we have in attendance is pretty good evidence that we made the right decision about where to locate this. Without the help of our co-faculty directors, uh, Sam and Professor Catherine Sharkey, who he will later introduce, uh, the civil justice, the civil jury project would never have gotten off to the start that we are witnessing today. So now I turn it over to Sam to introduce and moderate the first panel. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, uh, Steve. So the idea for the first panel is simply uh, what is the jury? Uh, where does it come from in our legal culture? And where is it heading? Uh, what are the issues that prevent it from realizing either what the original vision was or perhaps that show that the original vision uh, was flawed. Let me make uh, a couple of quick points before turning it over to them. I think that there are three different uh, conceptions of the jury that we carry forward in um, our political and constitutional tradition in this country. The first is uh, the one that we have probably forgotten except in civics classes, and that is that it was always a political organ. It was always a form of organization of the population as against potentially tyrannical state authority. And so we celebrate the tradition of Peter Zenger, we celebrate the idea of the jury as a form of resistance to government authority that can be overwhelming for individuals to confront if they don't have some organizational form. The second is that the jury is somehow a tribunal of the people. It is the expression of a collective wisdom. It is the expression of the, uh, the wisdom of the multitudes, wisdom of the crowds as we sometimes speak to it now. I know that for me as uh, a young boy watching movies about the law and thinking that one day I might be a lawyer, there was always the image of Spencer Tracy in Inherit the Wind or Gregory Peck in To Kill a Mockingbird, and they gave these wonderful orations, but there were always these people in the background to whom they directed their attention. It was the 12 angry men. It was the people who passionately deliberated. It was the people who could nod knowingly in other movie settings uh, when someone invokes the wisdom about how long it takes to cook grits or how the uh, car tires get caught in the Georgia mud. Now, I would add Cousin Vinny, of course, to that pantheon of great <laughs> movies about the law. And then we have a third image of today, which is a little bit more troubling and a little bit harder to get our hands around. I remember when I was a first year, uh, second year law student uh, working in DC, and there was the trial of John Hinckley for the shooting of President Reagan. And one of the conditions for jury service was that one had had no exposure from the media or the newspapers to the fact that Reagan had been shot. <laughs> and I wondered what sort of jury of one's peers one has when you didn't hear that the president had been shot in your town and that otherwise you would be disqualified. And there's a sad part to this, which is that the less that we have jury trials, the more that for ordinary people who have busy lives, the word jury service is combined with the words how to get out of. Uh, it is a, something you desperately want to avoid. Why? It's not because nobody wants to serve on a jury. It's because most of our experience with it is spending a day in the clutches of an anonymous bureaucracy and hoping, hoping that you will get out of there. And in my 15 years in New York, it's gotten much better. New York Supremes now has comfortable chairs. It has uh, Wi-Fi. But still, you have the sense of a day just being, you know, of your life being drained from you. You know, you're sitting there and nothing happens. 
So the popular experience is no longer Peter Zenger, and it's no longer uh, the, the great moment of the trial. So there's something off there. So that's what we're going to spend the first panel on. And we have just two, you know, you could not dream up a better panel. And uh, we, I'm not gonna give the long introductions because they're, they're in your program, but basically we have two people who have really staked themselves at the highest level of the debate about what this institution uh, should be. We have uh, Professor Renee Lerner from uh, GW who's gonna speak first and who has taken up quite dramatically the, the question of maybe like any other institution, its time comes and it goes. And then we have uh, Professor Akhil Lamar from Yale who's been become the leading chronicler of our constitutional tradition in, in certainly in, in my generation and who is someone who is going to take up the question of the continued vitality of the jury as an integral component of our constitutional order. So we will proceed in turn, we'll mix it up a little bit, and hopefully we'll have time for some questions from the audience. Renee? Oh, thank you, Sam. It is a delight to be here to discuss the civil jury. And thanks to this project, the subject will get the attention it deserves. And it's a special pleasure to be here with Akhil Amar, my mentor from Yale Law School. As you'll see, we have different views on the topic, as Sam suggested. But Akhil's creativity, his moral passion, his love for this country are qualities that all of his students admire and try to emulate. Alas, we can't copy his brilliance. <clears throat> I was invited to be the skunk at the picnic. <laughs> <laughs> and I almost wore black and white to emphasize that fact, but I restrained myself at the last minute. <clears throat> I appreciate the openness of Sam, of Kathy, and of Steve. And it says something about the seriousness of this conference and the project as a whole, that not only was a skunk invited, but the skunk is going first. <laughs> I hope it doesn't get so smelly that you all clear out immediately. The Seventh Amendment to the US Constitution, as you know, declares, in suits at common law, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved. Almost every state also has a guarantee of civil jury trial in its constitution. If you're interested, the exceptions are Louisiana and Colorado. Many of these state constitutions declare that the right of trial by jury shall remain inviolate. And yet, as we've seen, jury trials constitute 1% or less of civil dispositions in both federal and state court. Despite the constitutional provisions, civil jury trial has hardly been preserved, nor has it remained inviolate. This fact, though, becomes less surprising when you consider the fate of civil jury trial around the world. The US is just about the only country today that even pretends to hold civil jury trials. Civil jury trial either never existed or has been virtually abolished in every other country. Even England, the birthplace of the civil jury, and its former colonies of Australia, New Zealand, and Canada have abolished the civil jury for almost all civil cases. There's a reason for that. We in America have a myth about the jury. And the myth goes like this. At the founding of this country, the American people and the founders wanted liberty and democracy. They wanted to protect the traditional rights of Englishmen and especially jury trial. Jury trial decided all important civil cases. This gave the people a voice in the government. There's something to this myth. It's not all wrong. And one of the greatest experts on the American jury at the time of the revolution and the founding is sitting right here, Akhil Amar. What I want to do is to put the civil jury in a broader historical perspective. That is, I'm gonna talk about the civil jury well before and after the American founding. 
And what you'll see is that the fervor for the civil jury in the late 18th century was highly unusual. Civil jury trial by its nature has major drawbacks as a means of adjudication. And this was always recognized from the very beginning of civil jury trial in England. The Norman King Henry II and his advisors created the civil jury in 1166. This is contrary to Thomas Jefferson and other romantics. The institution did not come from the Anglo-Saxons. The system had considerable advantages. For one thing, it was more accurate than the traditional method of adjudication for Normans, which was trial by battle. Although I bet Steve would be pretty good at that as well. <laughs> <laughs> The system of judicial decision making, which developed in the church on the continent of Europe and then spread to the secular governments there, was not yet known in England in 1166. Henry did not have that option when he set out to design a civil justice system. This is an important fact. The second big advantage to the government of civil jury trial is that it was cheap. You hauled 12 laypersons together, whom you didn't pay, and you made them tell you who should win. This was a lot cheaper than maintaining professional judges and having them do the work of fact investigation and adjudication. So in effect, Henry transferred the cost to jurors and the parties. Judges, as the judges in this audience know, have to explain their decisions in writing and their decisions can be thoroughly appealed on the merits. With juries, you don't have to worry about any of that. The system had advantages, but it also had disadvantages. No one expected a group of 12 laypersons to be able to decide disputes involving complicated facts, multiple parties, multiple claims, and complex remedies. To enable decision-making by a jury, the system worked hard to radically simplify disputes. That was at the heart of the English common law system, which we inherited here. The common law developed various ways to try to cope with these shortcomings. Pleading rules and the writ system limited the number of parties that could appear, the number of claims the parties could make, how complicated a claim could be, and what remedy was available. Cases that went to a jury generally concerned only two parties, one claim for money damages, and one or at most a few simple questions of fact. A judge could comment on the evidence to help the jury understand. At common law, almost the only remedy for a jury making a mistake was a new trial. New trial is time consuming and expensive because the case has to be tried all over again but at least it was some way to correct jury error. Obviously, many disputes were more complicated and could not adequately be decided this way. So English judges developed entire separate systems to handle more complicated disputes with decisions by judges and not by juries. The main alternative system was equity. The system of equity decided many important cases, including questions of mortgages, bankruptcy, fraud, trusts, and business associations. Equity was able to administer more complicated remedies like injunctions. By the 18th century, judges in equity had to give written reasons for their decisions and those decisions could be appealed. Now the Seventh Amendment is based on the distinction between common law and equity. The amendment states that its requirements concerning jury trial apply in suits at common law not equity. So right away there was a large group of important cases that were not subject to jury trial. Americans at the time of declaring independence valued the civil jury mainly for a political reason. <clears throat> After the revolution that political reason became much weaker. Colonial and revolutionary Americans praised the jury for its ability to nullify hated British laws, especially laws about taxes in suits against government officials. While Americans were under British rule, juries were a way for Americans to govern themselves. But after independence, 
The American people formed the federal and state republics and governed themselves through elected officials in legislatures and the executive. The representative function of the jury therefore became less important. Jury nullification turned out to be deeply problematic in a self-governing republic. In the American republics, the people elected representatives to make and enforce the laws. Not only that, but the laws were made according to carefully designed procedures specified in constitutions, themselves ratified by the people or their representatives. And the question arises, why should 12 persons have the right to nullify laws made in this manner? And yet, nullify they did. In the New Republic, state juries were well known for sympathy toward debtors and verdicts against creditors. In effect, in certain cases, they nullified the law of contracts. James Madison was alarmed and worried that these verdicts would discourage the investment that the New Republic so badly needed. James Madison, in the Virginia Ratifying Convention, argued against having a federal right to jury trial. And in that, he was joined by Alexander Hamilton in the Federalist Number 83. There was a profound difference of opinion among the founders about whether there should be a right to civil jury trial in the federal constitution. Incidentally, there was no controversy over the criminal jury trial. Everybody understood that that should be in there. But about civil juries, there was great difference of opinion. As soon as the founding era was over, judges and legislatures, legislators began limiting jury trial, civil jury trial, I should emphasize. At the founding, the jury had been, as Tocqueville famously described it, a political institution. In the 19th century, however, many Americans in all areas wanted to encourage commercial development through predictable, uniform legal rules. Use of civil juries could lead to unlawful, unpredictable results that undermined the authority of legislatures and courts and thwarted the ability to plan and carry out actions. Many judges worked and legislators worked to limit the civil jury they did so in many ways. They increased the use of juryless proceedings in courts. They allowed parties to <coughs> waive civil jury trial. They approved increases in jury fees. They expanded the use of directed verdict and permitted judgment notwithstanding the verdict. Meanwhile, American lawyers operating in the adversarial system had slowed down jury trial tremendously. The changes included extensive procedures for selecting jurors especially voir dire. Voir dire, incidentally, has traditionally been and is still today unknown in England. Elaborate rules of evidence, dueling expert witnesses, exhaustive cross-examination, and long, complicated instructions to the jury on law. Representatives of the people complained bitterly about the burden of jury service to the jurors themselves, their families, and their work. There are many suggestions to improve these aspects of jury trial, and I'm sure we'll hear a lot about them today, including from Akil. But even if you speeded up jury trial, great problems would still remain. The final blow to the civil jury was the merger of the systems of common law and equity. This began in the late 19th century and continued into the 20th. I don't hear anyone proposing to undo that. It clearly makes sense to have a uniform system of procedure rather than two separate legal systems. But here's what happened. Equity conquered the common law. That had to be true because only equity could handle complex cases. The result has been the virtual end of civil jury trial. The old common law restrictions on cases going to a jury are gone. Now juries can hear cases involving many parties, many claims, and complicated issues. Few litigants want to take their chances with a jury in such a case. At common law, there were not many ways to get information about the case before trial. Trial was needed to find out what happened. Surprise was a major problem. After the merger of common law and equity, parties have many ways to get information before trial, all taken from equity. We know these today as pretrial discovery, depositions, document discovery, electronic discovery, interrogatories. 
This information helps parties settle and makes trial seem unnecessary. Pre-trial discovery is, of course, a huge component of litigation expense and needs to be controlled by judges familiar with the case in order to be effective. So here we are with virtually no litigants wanting to go to jury trial. There are significant problems with settlement in the shadow of the jury, which I won't go into here, but will probably come up in the course of this discussion today. The constitutional provisions concerning jury trial block proper adjudication. The cleanest and most <coughs> efficient thing would be to repeal them. Assuming that repeal is not going to happen anytime soon <coughs> because of interest represented in this room and because of popular sentiment, there are ways to interpret these provisions, sensible ways, to give more flexibility. Suits at common law originally meant suits between limited parties for limited numbers and types of claims, essentially for money damages. We can go back to that. The legislature can determine the rest. So then what do we do? <clears throat> I'm going to give a brief sketch of some of the ways that you can improve adjudication dramatically if you don't have juries. There are many examples of how to do this right from other legal systems. And we need to keep in mind that the English, the Germans, the Australians are not barbarians or anti-democratic because they do not use civil juries. And they've thought hard about some of these things and how to do adjudication right. It need not mean simply a switch from jury trials to bench trials. It could have a profound effect on all aspects of litigation, including the elimination of trials altogether. And on the continent of Europe, those languages do not have a word for trial. They call it a proceeding, in French, a procès. In the United States, we often fail to recognize <laughs> the many ways our system has been affected by the limitations of the jury. Other countries, of course, are well aware of the main danger of judicial adjudication, the biased or corrupt judge. Blackstone observed about this problem, and so did Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton also observed that juries could be biased or corrupt. Other systems take steps to guard against this danger. And I'm going to uh, give three main ways that adjudication can be improved. There are many others um, if you do away with juries, but I'm going to give three principal ways right now. One is by using a panel of judges. One of the main safeguards in countries that use uh, judicial adjudication is by using several judges to decide a case in the first instance rather than a single judge. These panels allow colleagues to correct a biased judge. Besides, several heads are often better at legal decision making than one. Steve often says this, right? Several heads are better than one. Precisely right, which is why panels of three or five judges are used in systems that use primarily judges to decide cases. Another point is, of course, that judges have to give decisions in writing, have to explain their reasoning, and that's an important safeguard. The final extremely important uh, point I'm going to make is that in systems that use judges to decide cases, appeal is very important. And this appeal is far more thoroughgoing than many of us in the common law system can imagine. It is usually appeal de novo of fact and law. Appeal de novo of fact and law. Our limited appeals are a legacy of the jury system. We try to control inputs, such as what evidence the jury hears or a judge's determin determinations on law. But there is very little control over outputs or the correctness of the verdict. In other legal systems, they pay far more attention to appeal, which is a serious corrective. Obviously, I think that timid reforms will not solve the many problems that the civil litigation system has today. And it's time to think more boldly. Thank you.
Good morning. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I want to begin uh, by expressing my very special thanks to Steve and Ellen Sussman. They have poured their blood and treasure into this fledgling organization. We would not be here but for their passion and commitment. Uh, I think the jury needs friends, um, and Steve and Ellen are very good friends to the jury, and I want to thank you for, for this. And, and I hope we'll look back and say, yes, we were all here um, at the beginning of something special. Um, uh, and I'm going to uh, uh, pick up on what Steve said about the beginning of something special by reminding you uh, what happened in mid-September, 228 years ago. But before I uh, uh, do that, I also want to uh, uh, thank, uh, say I'm, I'm especially honored to be um, on, a, on a panel with, uh, with my friends um, uh, uh, Sam and, and Renee um, at this amazing law school. Um, uh, Who's, who's great leader you've already heard from, uh, Trevor Morrison, Kathy, another former student. It's great to see you here too. We, we are in um, the capital of the world, in this great city, in this great university. And 228 years ago, you see, um, for the first time in, in world history, uh, a document was put forth to be deliberated on and voted on by an entire continent. That has never before happened in human history and the world would be transformed, you see, by it. And this is mid-September, Constitution Week, 1787, um, when the bold words of the preamble, we, the people of the United States, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. We actually did something. We put the thing to a vote up and down a continent. Here were the voting rules here in New York because um, you may not, actually have, have learned this, many of you, because you learned your history from Charles Beard, who knew this fact and w withheld it from you, or Howard Zinn. <laughs> All, here, here are the voting rules in New York. On, with, on the Constitutional Convention, it's gonna meet in Poughkeepsie to decide whether this a great empire state should, should ratify the Constitution. All adult free men, citizens, fem female citizens, get to vote. Um, and that wasn't the ordinary rules for voting, but in eight of the 13 states, property qualifications were lowered or eliminated compared to what they ordinarily were because this is very special, this we the people moment. So there were no race tests. There were no religious tests. There were no property qualifications. There were no literacy qualifications. We the people actually did something extraordinary. Democracy exists almost nowhere in the planet in 1786 other than the United States. Britain, although it has a hereditary monarch, was actually real power, unlike Queen Elizabeth, who basically um, reigns but does not rule. Um, but you had a hereditary monarch, you had a hereditary House of Lords that had real power, unlike today where it's just vestigial. The so-called House of Commons was not particularly democratic. Um, you had to own or rent real property generating an annual income of 600 pounds sterling just to be a member of um, the House of Commons. That's annual income. If you're a, a, a Jane Austen fan, that would be like Darcy's Pemberley or Bingley's estate or something like, <laughs> like that. Um, an established church. Um, uh, um, so, but there was some self-government in, in Britain, some in Switzerland, because you know the, the Swiss, there was, they didn't have banks, they didn't have cities, there was sort of nothing worth invading for. You have to, <laughs> you have to charge up a hill, and what do you get when you get to the top? Um, so that's, that's democracy in the world in 1786. And so it had been throughout most of recorded history, 1686, 1586. Self-government exists almost nowhere in the planet for all of recorded history. It exists under tiny little city-states um, that, that manage to maintain democracy for a brief period of time and then flicker out, pre-imperial Rome. Athens, and speaking of Athens, they had juries that was constitutive of their democracy under the Cleisthenic Constitution, under Pericles. But they weren't able to make it last um, in time or in space. Uh, people who meet face-to-face, um, uh, gov um, uh, same climate, same culture, worshiping the same god or gods. It's, it's not remotely like what we, the people of the United States, did beginning this time of year, 228 years ago, uh, September 1787. And you see, the world was transformed. Democracy exists over half the planet today, and it's because of what we, the people, did. It's because of the success, military, political, economic, social, uh, cultural, and legal success of the American Constitutional Project. You see it, and, and now a billion people in India are self-governing. Uh, a huge uh, multiple religions, free and fair elections, uh, parties um, alternating in power, um, written constitution, judicial review, did I mention religious tolerance? Um, um, 
That wasn't true when my parents were born in undivided India, and that's because of what we the people did, okay? Now, what's the first thing we the people did? We said, dudes, you forgot the rights, okay? Our Bill of Rights comes from <clears throat> that we the people process, that year-long process where we actually deliberated on the Constitution. And more people got to vote on the Constitution than ever been able to vote on anything before in human history by orders of magnitude, and there was broad free speech and deliberation. You could oppose the Constitution, and actually you weren't voted off the island. In fact, people opposed the Constitution, become presidents of the United States, James Monroe, vice presidents of the United States from this state, George Clinton, um, Elbridge Gerry, justices on the Supreme Court. You vote against, <clears throat> the Declaration of Independence wasn't put to vote. Most of the state constitutions in 1776 weren't put to a vote. English constitution has never been put to you know, any kind of uh, popular vote, and, and you don't do that in Australia and, um, and Germany and some of the other places you heard about. Um, but we, um, uh, 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 but in 1776, if you're opposed to independence, here are your choices. One, leave. Two, shut up. Uh, no one who opposes the Declaration, because this is, not a, this is not a joke. This is, you know, um, uh, fighting has already uh, broken out. 30,000 troops are on their way um, in a, a massive amphibious invasion, and when they land, they're going to slit our throats. Um, and and uh, Brooklyn, um, if, if, w w it's miraculous. Read uh, David McCullough's 1776, that Washington is able to sort of evacuate um, first from Brooklyn and then from Manhattan and keep his army intact. So in 1776, if you oppose independence, you're never heard from again politically. And that's not true in 1787. It begins with this epic vote and conversation. And the first thing people do is say, <clears throat> you forgot the rights and here's why. Or here's what that shows. That small groups of people, even smart people in a room will get stuff wrong. They were hot and, and it was humid and they were homesick. If I'm being blunt, they were horny. They wanted to go home. And, um, and George Mason, in this room in Philadelphia, says, let's, let's do a Bill of Rights. And he's actually thinking centrally about a civil jury. That's actually how it first begins. And the other people think, George Mason is a pain in the butt. You know, he says it's going to take a day or two, but it's going to be several more weeks we want to go home. And they screwed up big time, and it almost torpedoed the whole thing. So that's what happens when these smart guys sometimes just meet in a room. Smart guys like James Madison, he changed his mind. He proposes the Bill of Rights later when actually he gets the input from this election, you see, bottom up, grassroots. Um, so um, there is safety in numbers. There is wisdom in the crowd. This is what actually we Democrats believe, that actually the people sometimes have a broader wisdom than elites behind closed doors. And the first thing that we say is, where are the rights? The phrase that appears in more of the Bill of Rights than any other is the, are the words, the people. The First Amendment right of the people to petition and assemble. The Second Amendment right for the people to keep and bear arms. Fourth Amendment right of the people to be secure against unreasonable searches and seizures. Retain and reserve rights under the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. The people, the people, the people, the people, the people. That's because it's coming, all of this, bottom up from this we the people process that Steve began us with in September 1787. The Constitution was crowdsourced. It's Wikipedia avant la lettre. <laughs> it's very bottom up and, and version 2.0, we call that the Bill of Rights. And now, let me tell you, the central idea, not a peripheral idea, the central idea of the Bill of Rights, if I had to pick a single one, is actually the jury. Not civil jury, but all juries, grand juries, criminal pettit juries. Um, and, 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 this is, and this is the central idea that emerges from the hinge of human history. Before 1787, almost no democracy in the planet. Today, over half the planet, because in this one year, beginning in September, mid-September, we the people actually did ordain and establish a constitution in a broad democratic conversation. So let me go through the Bill of Rights for you very quickly. First Amendment, you see, it talks about the freedom of the press, and that, and that was centrally understood as Zenger, involving John Peter Zenger, from this city where a jury got up on its hind legs and acquitted against the evidence because the judges are part of the administration. Um, and why do we have this rule against prior restraint? See, because if you can't do prior restraint, but you can punish after the fact, that does exert, uh, to borrow a phrase, a certain chilling effect if they can cut my head off um, you know, after I speak. So, so what's so good about a rule that says, oh, well, you can't restrain speech in advance, but once someone says something, you can, you can chop their head off. Here's, here's what that's all about. Because 
prior restraint it can be issued by an administrative agency or by a judge in an injunction, and when you violate it, you go to the pokey and there's no jury intervention. Just ask Kim Davis, who might, is not, I'm not a fan of hers, but, um, <coughs> but prior restraints are enforced without juries, whereas after the fact, punishment requires 12 people, 12 then men, today men and women, good and true, to say, we think you should go to prison or lose your, you lose your life. Prior restraint is all about jury trial. Zenger is all about jury trial. It's at the heart of our First Amendment tradition. Now, what about the Second Amendment? You say, well, Professor, doesn't say anything about juries there. First Amendment does talk about the right of the people, you see. And the Second Amendment does too. And it's all about militias at the founding. And militias are jurors with guns in their hands. That's what they are. <laughs> they are locally organized against the national government, militias and juries. They are amateurs against the professionals, um, against the army, against um, judges and, and prosecutors. They, it, there is a right and a duty, you see, militia service, you're summoned for it. You are summoned for jury duty. These are the twin rights and responsibilities of citizens. I would say voting is another one. These are the political rights and responsibilities, and they are linked, you see. Um, in important ways, this Second Amendment vision. There's a whole continuity before we have a modern um, specialization of labor industrial state. Um, and Rene began by sort of talking about how law enforcement, how the system works before you have all the professionals. There's a continuity between um, the hue and cry and the posse comitatus of the neighborhood, neighborhood watch, and, and the posse comitatus, and the self-informing grand, uh, the militia, and the self-informing grand jury. These are all sort of on a continuum of, of um, democratic self-governance, you see. The Third Amendment reflects anxiety about a standing army. It's very similar to the Second. The Fourth Amendment, it's the right of the people to be secure um, from unreasonable searches and seizures. Who enforced that? Jurors did. When, when people searched or seized unreasonably, they were sued. The Constitution does not require warrants, the Fourth Amendment does. It limits them. It says, no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause and oath or affirmation. Why were warrants actually limited? Because they issue from judges ex parte. And that can be a problem, you see. Um, um, but, but when the, uh, an official searched or seized unreasonably, there would be a civil jury trial in our system, a Seventh Amendment jury trial, and you would sue the officer, and if, they, and if a jury thought it was, because what's reasonableness? That's a tort issue, and, and that's a mixed question, at least a fact in law, and that involves juries deciding often in, in collaboration with a judge what's reasonable and unreasonable, and then deciding the second stage what sort of damages should issue Punitive damages, the very concept of punitive damages issue, in, enters an entire, across our um, legal system, enters into the Anglo-American world in a series of proto-Fourth Amendment cases involving unreasonable searches and seizures. The cases involve a man named John Wilkes, as in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, and Wilkes County, Georgia, and Wilkes County, North Carolina. Um, 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 and, um, and the judge is Camden, as in Camden, New Jersey, Camden, South Carolina, Camden, Maine, Camden Yards, where the Orioles play. The, this is the, these are the most famous cases in the Anglo-American world, in the American world. Just look at a map, and they give us actually the concept of punitive damages, and it's judges and juries working together to keep the government honest, and that's actually your Fourth Amendment. And the Fifth Amendment talks about grand juries, and the Sixth Amendment celebrates pettit juries, criminal pettit juries, and the Seventh Amendment, civil juries, and the Eighth Amendment has restrictions on um, a bail and, um, and punishment because judges in sentencing are acting without juries, judges in bail determinations are acting without juries, and then you have the Ninth and the Tenth Amendments that talk about rights reserved to and for the people, um, and the jury is, you see, the embodiment of, of popular sovereignty par excellence. This is not a peripheral idea. It's a central idea, and juries are connected. Now, um, let me just say a few more things and then sit down, because, of course, we want to hear from you, um, the people in this room. <laughs> um, so don't look at the civil jury in isolation. Look at it as, um, first of all, connected to criminal juries and grand juries. Um, and when you do, for example, you realize, well, juries don't always have to be unanimous. Uh, grand juries don't. That's not of the essence of the thing. Mm, um, uh, you. 
Um, we'll see they don't even always have to be mute. Um, uh, uh, grand juries actually issue reports. There was a spectacular student note when I was a, a professor a while back written about um, grand jury presentments, one of the best student notes you know, I've ever had the honor to supervise. Uh, the author, of course, was Rene Leto. Um, <laughs> Uh, so they don't have to be mute, um, and uh, 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 there's an analogy between voters and jurors, you see. This is political participation. When you understand the big idea, popular sovereignty, jurors vote. That's what they do, and voters should serve. Um, there's an intimate connection uh, between them, and, 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 and do the militia, too. If you actually look at the presumptive va uh, voters under the 14th Amendment, Section 2, it's basically adult male citizens over 21, who are basically your, your, your militia um, as well. So analogies between jurors and voters, analogies um, between uh, ju jurors and legislators. The juror, um, jurors are sort of um, um, uh, part of the, our lawmaking um, and law uh, uh, apparatus. Um, the jury is the, uh, here's the bicameral analogy. The jury is the lower house of a bicameral judiciary. We have a bicameral legislature, House and Senate, and you wouldn't want to keep the House of Representatives out of the loop. And we have actually a bicameral executive in the military that's actually the professional army and the lower branch of the local militia. Um, and in the judiciary system, that's actually in the executive branch, the, uh, the professional prosecutor and the grand jury, and they both have to actually countersign before an indictment issues. There's bicameralism in the legislative process. There's no law unless both House and criminal law unless both House and Senate vote to create a criminal law. There's no prosecution unless both uh, the upper house of the, basically the attorney general, the justice department, um, and the lower house, a grand jury, signs off on it. And there's no conviction unless both judge and jury in, within the judiciary on the criminal side um, um, oh, um, rule against um, the defendant. A jury has an absolute right to acquit against the evidence, we, we call it null, sometimes called nullification, and, and that's... That's double jeopardy. The quit is quit. You are done. There's no retrial. Never has been. That's Sanger. That's, that continues to be true today. So the bicameral analogy, the, or the legislative analogy, the voting analogy, think about not just civil juries, but all juries. Now, once you do that, and here are some reforms or some ways, because we have to bring it into the 21st century. Of course we do. But we, we, I wouldn't want to give up on this idea that the people we, the people of the United States, in the moment that changed all of human history, thought was not peripheral, but central to the whole project. I don't like peremptory challenges. Uh, I know that's gonna be very controversial because some of you make your living off of that. And Upton Sinclair says, you see, it's very hard to convince a man, to, it's very hard for a man to understand something if his salary depends on his not understanding it. But it's, it's about democracy, you see, and a right of participate, uh, participating, and we don't peremptorily challenge um, voters. It's not a right to impartial jurors, it's a right to an impartial jury and when and their safety in numbers and our partialities cancel out when you bring in lots of us. Um, and there's no constitutional right expressed or implied to peremptories and they're used to actually uh, discriminate against uh, women and gays and blacks and lawyers piously deny this and it's happening every day in our courtroom and it's a disgrace. Um, and once you understand the legislative analogy and the uh, um, in the voter analogy, you see the problem. People are being denied their right to vote, their right to participate. It's not just about the parties, you see. The reason I don't agree with Kim Davis is this is not about her. She's not getting married, okay? Um, and it's, jury trial is not just about the parties' rights. It's about the jurors' rights to participate in the system. It's about democracy. Tocqueville says the jury is a free public school, ever open, teaching men their rights and duties. This is how we learn to govern ourselves, you see. Um, and so peremptory challenges, we've got to get rid of. Now, if we do do, do that, and, and excuses for cause, they should be limited. It's not a disqualification if you're a judge, if you, if you know that um, uh, 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 President Reagan was shot at. Why should it be a disqualification to be a juror? That um, you were um, <coughs> influenced by the Hinckley case. For me, it was OJ, and here was the joke. You know, knock, knock, who's there? OJ, OJ who? Congratulations, you're on the jury. A reverse <laughs> literacy test. Um, for jury service, if it's not a disqualification to, uh, to be a judge to know something, why should it be? And there are 12 jurors, and they, they cancel each other out. So restrict um, challenges for cause, restrict peremptory challenges. Now, that's going to mean more people participate good. We shouldn't have six. We should have 12. And we could have even more than 12. Uh, once you understand that grand juries are, are 24, 
this is not a cost, ultimately. It is a benefit to the system to bring more people involved in participation. My wife always asks why I teach twice as much as, as Yale um, asked me to, and I say, because they let me. This is not a cost. This is actually a benefit. I want to whitewash that fence, and people actually, in the long run, our democracy dies if people don't participate. It's both a right and duty, and that's true of militia service. I believe voting is a right and a duty. We might not be able to force it. I believe freedom of speech is a right and duty. We have a duty not just to speak, but to listen, actually, and deliberate. We can't enforce all of these things all the time, but, but, but this is what, if you should agree, in principle, this is what it's about. It's not just about efficient adjudication. It's about democracy, popular sovereignty, our entire way of life. Now, if we bring more people in, blacks, women, gays, um, um, in case you didn't, uh, you know, in case you hadn't noticed, ours is a deeply divided society, uh, very riven. So it's possible we're not gonna get unanimity. And we don't have unanimity in the House, we don't have it in the Senate, we don't have it in the Supreme Court, if this is the lower house of bicameral judiciary. So if we do get rid of peremptories, we're gonna have more diversity on the jury. We're probably gonna to need to rethink unanimity, um, and maybe even in criminal cases, but in, in, in civil cases. We wanna encourage deliberation, so maybe you have to be unanimous on day one to give Henry Fonda 24 hours to, to pick up his second vote, and, and maybe, um, 10-2 will suffice on day three or something like that, and they do that. Um, Renee was wonderful in her comparative um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, law, bringing in how other societies do it, and other societies actually do have um, unanimity um, in the first day and then sort of ratcheting down um, uh, thereafter. We have to pay jurors for their time, um, and we have to make it easier to serve on juries. Um, they should, they work for us. You know, we the people are sovereign, and yet, the, the, the lawyers' lounges are nicer, and the ju judges' chambers are nicer, and they, uh, they summon you whenever they decide they want to know. Ask me a year in advance when I'm paying my taxes which week will work best for, for me. Exam week does not work so well for me. Um, <laughs> summer, that's great. The three best things in my job are called June, July, and August. And I'll tell you that when you ask me for my taxes in April, what week will work for me? And then I should show up, you know, unless there's a death in the family. That week we should make it easier for people to serve. We should pay them for their time. We should not waste their time. If we get rid of peremptories and some of the rest, it can be more streamlined. Um, we should treat them as if they actually govern this country, which is what 200 years ago, 228 years ago, the people understood when they reared up on their hindlands. They should be able to ask questions. Um, so they're, they're citizens of a self-governing democracy, maybe mediated in a certain way. They should be able to take notes. Um, the judges can take notes, my students take notes. Um, they, they should be um, told what the elements of the offense are at the beginning of the process so they can try to un process everything that's told to them through all that. They should be treated like citizens of a self-governing republic and the point of this should be actually ultimately to draw them in to our democracy. We have embarrassingly low rates of political participation, and they go hand in hand with the diminution, it seems to me, of this right and duty of jury service. Lots more to say, um, but um, I think I've just, I hope, said enough to, to get you um, thinking, at least. Um, I, just, I guess I want to end by saying some of my reforms are going to cost money. We're going to have more trials, more juries. I'm going to streamline some ways getting rid of peremptories, pay jurors for, for, for their time, and Here's the bottom line point, and it's about how we fund our elections, which is terrible, too. I'm for public financing in various ways. You know, democracy costs money. Running a census costs money. Running a fair election costs money. All this costs money, but in the long run, public ignorance always costs more than public education. And what the jury basically about is all about in, in, in the most profound way popular sovereignty, we the people, it's how we govern ourselves. We shouldn't be teaching this just in civil procedure or criminal procedure. This is con law 101. It's like how you structure the House of Representatives. It's the same issue. Popular sovereignty, rule by the people, constitutional governance, public education. That's actually what the civil jury is all about, and that's why I'm so grateful to the Sussmans for supporting this because there's not a constituency out there. It's a hassle. Who wants to, so, uh, um, to serve on, 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 on the jury? It, it, it's a hassle. So, so juries are, um, don't have natural champions, you see, be, just because it's a very diffuse um, interest, just like voting. 
It's a very diffuse interest. And, and, and it will prevail only if we create, actually, organizations that understand themselves to be fiduciaries for this great constitutional right. So I want to end where I began by tipping my hat to Steve and Ellen Sussman for devoting their blood and treasure to creating this amazing organization. It's been an honor to speak to you. Thank you. So I, I think we have generated the first concrete reform proposal of our project, which is to let jurors bear arms. <laughs> and I suspect that there will be shorter trials as a result. Uh, Long-winded lawyers will be short-lived. Uh, so I want to um, uh, ask one question that I think um, is a pervasive undercurrent in the discomfort about the jury and which was not uh, really brought out in uh, either of, the, of these spectacular initial presentations. And that is that when we put people together, we like to tell a story about the will, wisdom of the, of the masses, mm -hmm. the, uh, the ability of the multitude to get it right, to guess how much the ox weighs at the, can mm -hmm. at the county fair and all these other wonderful stories. But we have another story also about what happens when people get together, and it's a cascade story. That is, that you get not wisdom, but you get a lynch mob. And there is an undercurrent in American history of the concern about uh, local vengeance and about populations that will turn against the other. Uh, particularly the majority will turn against the other. The tyranny of the majority is a long-standing concern in American political thought. And the jury is supposed to be a microcosm of the majority. And so we go back and we see, for example, that when Congress drafted Title VII in 1964, part of the Civil Rights Act, that it carefully drew the boundaries of the remedies so that uh, black victims of employment discrimination would never have to face a southern white jury because it was thought that the jury would perpetuate the discrimination, not be an antidote to the oppressiveness of the local authorities. We speak in New York of something called the Bronx Effect, which is basically that medical malpractice insurance rates are much higher for doctors who practice in the Bronx than for those who practice in Manhattan. There, is, there have at various points been West Virginia effects or Alabama effects in which local juries exact retribution against outsiders um, corporations, companies, uh, we can term it the Madison County effect, the Jefferson County effect, we have a lot of terms for this. But the basic idea is it is scary to put a dozen people who are co uh, connected by localism and let them judge outsiders. And so part of the rights revolution of the 20th century has been a distrust of majoritarian institutions. So I wonder, Renee and, and Akil, we don't have that much time, but is this something that is eroding the jury as well? This is a fundamental problem, and it goes back well before um, uh, civil rights issues or anything like that, well before the 20th century. This was recognized as a problem in America in the 18th century. This was what James Madison was concerned about. He was concerned that local juries would find against out-of-state or foreign creditors. And he was afraid that, as a result, the economy would suffer. So this is a long-standing problem. And one of the reasons why Madison did not want a right to a civil jury trial in the federal constitution. Um, there are issues of systematic jury bias, clearly. And I think one of the things you get when you have adjudication by judges is you have the ability to control some of that, some of that, because judges, of course, will have their own biases. But you can help to counteract that by using panels of judges. They must produce written opinions. They must explain in writing what they're doing and why. Juries do not have to do that. Juries can come up with decisions clearly against fact and law, and no one holds them accountable. And the second and very important point is that those decisions by judges are subject to thorough appeal. 
And so I think you help to correct for some of these problems by using judicial adjudication. Here's where I very much agree with Renee. Um, <coughs> uh, uh, civil juries don't work everywhere. They've got some limits. So now we have to think about, um, so um, none of us actually went to uh, Harvard Law School. Um, I think Oliver Wendell Holmes is hugely overrated because Harvard's been pushing this thing. And he says, the Constitution does not enact Mr. Herbert Spencer's social statics. Fine, Mr. Justice Holmes, what does it enact? Okay, um, so juries aren't great at everything, and I agree. Now, but I think we should find, actually, situations where they are good, maybe even better than anything else. Even if um, they hadn't been, um, they weren't around, we should invent them today. Here's one situation where I actually think the civil jury is absolutely spectacular, then and now. Um, where there is local government abuse, um, Ferguson-like situations, um, Eric Garner-like situations, um, and here's the, the analogy to the militia. I would like, actually, because what's the modern counterpart to the militia at the federal level? It would be our army today, which really is America, because we, we don't really have a national defense structure based on the militia, in part because localities misbehaved in this thing called the Civil War. And since I mentioned the Civil War, Lincoln was a great jury lawyer, okay? And that's connected to his ability to, to talk to ordinary people. Um, so we didn't get rid of juries after the Civil War, but localism is a special problem, even before, but, but after um, um, the, the, the Civil War. Um, uh, uh, but um, when, um, uh, but especially after, uh, 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 militias have been translated, today they are the army, um, which is more national, but ordinary people. Tom Hanks is a school teacher um, in Saving Private Ryan, you know, uh, and he's from Pennsylvania, but the other people are from um, Mississippi and some ethnic um, fast talkers from, from New York, okay? And that's not a local militia, but that's ordinary people, nationalistic. And then the other counterparts of the militia is the police department. And it's supposed to look like America, look like the community. That's community-based policing. That's the militia idea when it comes to law enforcement. And who's going to keep them accountable? Well, a citizen review board, maybe, that's a, a jury adaptation. It's in, it, within the administrative branch, but sort of monitoring them. And it, it should look like the community. Or a jury. And a jury is on both sides of, of the locality, on both sides of that equation. Um, when the cops mi arguably misbehave in a Fourth Amendment situation where you sue them for police brutality, for unreasonable uh, uh, conduct, if the jury is too aggressive toward the police officers, they're going to suffer the consequences of under-policing because uh, they can be victims of crime. Um, and if they look the other way then uh, too much and let the cops have free reign, they're going to suffer on the other end from, from overzealous enforcement. And I think they're particularly well suited, better than David Souter, whom I like. In a case called City um, Atwater versus City of Lago Vista, read it. It was 12 years ago. A cop in Texas misbehaved. There was a, a soccer mom. She didn't have seat belts for the kids, and he threw and he arrested her and he threw her in prison. Um, um, and and that's the Sandra Bland of On La Letra. Um, and, and, the, and the Supreme Court said, well, we have to decide this. No, a local jury was perfectly positioned. I, I wrote a, an op-ed in the LA Times. You can, you can you Google it in, th in two minutes on this. Local juries, let's find what they are good at. Maybe they're not good at everything. Maybe not complex civil litigation. Not when you have an, an out-of-state um, defendants that, who might be vulnerable to um, a BMW versus Gore like um, uh, Robin Hood justice. But, Let's try to find, because there, there surely is something that 12 persons, good and true, are good at, and we need to find ways to bring them into democracy, into our system. Well, we are unfortunately out of time. We could go on uh, with this panel a long time, or at least I could. Um, but uh, uh, we have to uh, uh, cede to the next panel. Before uh, thanking our panelists, let me just say that uh, my wonderful colleague, Kathy Sharkey, who's uh, the other faculty director of the project, will uh, take over the moderating now. And so please join me in, in thanking our great panelists. <laughs>